If there's one aspect of cognitive performance that's worth enhancing, then it probably should be focus. With more focus, you can work harder and longer on a single task without being distracted or without procrastinating. This means you can work on more projects, get more done. There's enough time in the day to achieve amazing things, but unfortunately a lot of us just lack the focus and the concentration to work on those things. And so in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can increase your focus, your concentration, by understanding a little bit of the neuroscience behind it. So I've talked a bit about flow states in the past and achieving heightened states of awareness, etc. But there's a lot more to focus and concentration than that. So our ability to focus is handled by a network of brain regions called the salience network. And this handles what's called executive attention, our ability to focus on one task and to choose what that task or that stimulus might be. One of the key structures in this brain network is the anterior cingulate cortex or the ACC. And this is connected to the hypothalamus and the brainstem, as well as the prefrontal cortex. When this brain region, the ACC, is damaged, it can result in massively lower levels of focus and motivation. In fact, people who lose this part of the brain or function in this part of the brain, they can end up so unmotivated that they can't even move. So we know it plays a really important role in not only focus, but also motivation, because those two things are tightly connected. So we know that the prefrontal cortex is responsible for our ability to plan and to think ahead. And meanwhile, our hypothalamus is partly responsible for our emotional responses. And this is connected to our endocrine system via our pituitary gland. So you have your logical reasoning motivation and you have your emotionally driven motivation. We can also break the salience network down into two separate other networks. You have the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. So an overstream and an understream. The dorsal stream is responsible for our conscious decision-making, our conscious motivation and focus. This is when we decide, I'm gonna focus on this and we do it. And then our ventral stream is responsible for the other kind of attention, the emotionally driven attention. This is when we hear a loud noise and suddenly we break from what we're doing and we look over there at what's happening. Or it's when we feel uncomfortable so we can't focus because we're just focused on how uncomfortable we are. And it's responsible for what's known as the cocktail effect, which is where if you're at a party and you hear someone mention your name, suddenly your ears prick up because your emotional response is connected to that sound. And you think something's important happening, something relevant to me is happening. It's dopamine in these brain areas that tells us that something important is happening. So dopamine is the reward hormone, the reward neurotransmitter, and it's released not as a reward for doing something, but actually to tell us that what we're doing is important and we're driving towards a reward. So dopamine tells us to focus, to remember what we're doing. And when this is released in the relevant brain area, our attention switches that way via these streams. Likewise, we release adrenaline and cortisol, stress hormones, other stimulatory hormones, and they likewise shift our attention to things that we might think are dangerous or scary or otherwise worthy of our attention. So this is all very interesting, but what can we take from this? What can we practically do with this information? Well, on the one hand, we now know that our emotions play a big role in focus, and this is what's so often missing from our attempts to focus on a project. We think that our focus and our attention is entirely about will, it's about planning and logic, but actually a lot of it is emotional. Our, emo our motivation is emotional. You know that when you buy something, it's almost always emotionally driven. Salespeople know this well. They'll try and pitch something to you and they won't focus on the logic. They won't tell you this is a sensible decision. They'll tell you, everyone's got this product. It's really cool, it's really exciting. They'll tell you it feels great in the hand. They try and appeal to your emotion because emotion is very often what drives our decision-making and our focus. And emotion, from an evolutionary perspective, exists to tell us what's important for our survival. So if something seems important to our survival or our status or our likelihood of finding a mate or finding food, then it seems important. And if something seemingly has no survival value, then we're disinterested. So that kind of makes a lot of sense when you think about it. This is why it's so hard to focus on entering data into a dull spreadsheet or it's so hard to focus on a book that you're not really enjoying or to learn a language when it gets to the difficult parts. It tells you why you often drift off in a boring conversation because it's just not relevant to you. And your body is producing emotions and hormones, neurotransmitters to say there's more important stuff going on over here. It also tells you why it's so hard to concentrate when there's noise behind you because your brain is like, is any of this important? It tells you why it's so hard to concentrate when there's something else you'd rather be doing because your motivation, your emotion is dragging you in that position. But we can use all this to our advantage. If you understand that emotion is what drives your motivation and your focus, then you can hack this system and use it to achieve all kinds of things. 
So one of the things I struggle with is waking up early in the morning. I find it hard to get out of bed. And I always try to do the logical thing, use kind of CBT type approaches and tell myself why I need to get out of bed, why it's important and how lying in bed isn't gonna help me. But what I actually found was the best way to force myself out of bed was to give myself something that I really wanted to do and that was just a small step, some emotional reason to get out of bed. And for me, it's checking my emails and my responses on my YouTube videos because that's something I'm excited to do. So even though a lot of people say you shouldn't look at a phone first thing in the morning, for me, that's something I'm driven to do. So when the alarm goes off at 5.30 or at 6 and I think, I can't be bothered to get out of bed. I think, well, I am interested in knowing if there's been any comments on my YouTube videos. And so I grab my phone and I look at it and that gives me enough kind of mental stimulation to start coming around and then getting out of bed is much easier. And the next thing I want to do is get that coffee. So if you want to make yourself do something, you need to make it interesting, emotionally, emotionally motivating to yourself in order to be able to do it. It's no good just telling yourself you need to do it. Please do it. Come on, we have to do it now. You need to give yourself that emotional hook, that emotional reason to do it. Likewise, if you're working on an essay, if you're working on a project, you need to give yourself the emotional hook, the emotional reason to be doing that thing if you want to stay focused. Don't just be working on dry topics because eventually you're just gonna burn out. Something else will seem more interested. There's only so long you can sustain um, attention using just that dorsal stream, you need the ventral stream to be working with you. So if what you're working on is really boring and dull and you find it hard to focus on it, you need to make it more interesting. And the way you can often do that is just to remember what it is about that thing that is most valuable or most interesting to you. You can almost always find something interesting about a topic, even if it's dull to you. Part of my job involves writing about the most boring stuff. I have to write about car windows, I have to write about bricklaying sometimes, not stuff that I have any knowledge about or, in, or you know, even interest in. But what I do is I try and think, well, how can I relate this to myself? What, what emotional investment do I have in this topic? So if I'm writing about car windows, I write about things like attention and focus because you need to be attentive to the road. That's why you can't have a cracked car window. If I'm writing about bricklaying, I might talk about how it's great for building grip strength. So these are things I'm interested in and then I'm motivated to write those things and that means I'm much less likely to get distracted. Likewise, you can just try and remember the reason you're doing it and focus on the emotional hook behind that. So if you're doing a job that you hate and you're finding it really hard to focus, or if you're washing up in the kitchen, picture how good it will feel when it's done. Picture how good it'll feel when your kitchen is nice and pristine. And when you're working bored at work, picture what it'll be like when you eventually get that promotion and feel the emotional reason to carry on working through like that. What's also really important is that you avoid other ventral stream distractions. So you can't have the noises in the background, you can't have people chattering, and you wanna take away things that you're looking forward to. So if there's something you're looking forward to and that's taking up too much of your mental space and you can't focus on what you're meant to be doing, then just tell yourself, I will be allowed to do this later. So if I'm too interested in playing Sonic Forces, I say to myself, once you've finished at 5 p.m., you can play that. So hopefully that's a bit less of a distraction. I can lock it away in the back of my brain. Likewise, if you've got anything pressing that you need to do, if you have emails you need to answer, if you have calls you need to make, do those right away. Tim Ferriss calls them open loops, I think. I think that was Tim Ferriss. And this is basically anything that's playing on your mind and nagging at you, taking away your motivation and your energy. And when you get those done, again, it's easier to focus on the big things. You want to maintain a state known as homeostasis. That's when you're neutral. That's when you're not hungry, not hot, not cold, not too excited, not too tired. So that means you need to look after yourself physically. You need to make sure you're well slept. You need to make sure that you're eating well. You need to make sure that you're not too cold or too hot because these are things that will distract you from what you're supposed to be doing. Matt Mullenweg of WordPress fame, he says that he uses a technique where he'll listen to music on headphones and then he'll play the same couple of tracks over and over again. And because he knows it so well, he eventually becomes kind of desensitized to it. And this is almost like sensory deprivation. It completely removes that distraction from him, the audio distraction, and he can focus more on what he's doing. So find ways to tune out the world, make sure you're comfortable, make sure you take breaks. And that's the other thing I want to talk about because focus takes energy, especially dorsal attention. Using your prefrontal cortex, having a plan, sticking at something and avoiding those distractions using your will, that takes energy. And if you're too tired, you won't be able to focus and you won't be able to concentrate. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you're well rested at all times. And this is the big thing. A lot of us think, oh, I'm gonna write the world's best novel in the evenings. I'm gonna launch my own business. I'm gonna start a workout. Then we fail and we say, I didn't have time. Well, you did probably have time because otherwise you wouldn't have watched the whole box set of Game of Thrones. What you've probably not got enough of is energy. 
And again, it's likely emotional energy. It's all of those interactions with people. This is why it's good to do your most important work, the most important work to you first thing in the morning whilst you've still got all of that emotional energy and all of that focus. And also to try and remove things that are stealing your energy, stealing your focus, because you won't have any left at the end of the day otherwise. Time your work around when you know you work best and recognize that your energy is a finite thing and that you need energy if you're going to focus and concentrate. Finally, build lots of small rewards into what you're doing. Build lots of small tests, response, reward. Because some things are naturally very easy to focus on, very easy to concentrate, whereas other things are harder to do so with. When I'm editing a video or when I'm programming, I get into a flow state. I'm so focused, I forget to go to the toilet. And it's hard not to. When I'm editing, I always get into that state. And that's because I have that feeling of testing something small, checking it, getting that reward. So that is the emotional goal. That gives me that kind of kick, the reason to keep going. And then each time I go through the same little cycle. And every time I watch my video and it's a bit better, or I run my app and it actually works, I get a little kick of dopamine that keeps me going. And this is why some programmers get kind of so wired in. Oh, he's wired in. And some CEOs will purposefully take advantage of that nature to work them completely dry. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but you can build in these little reward cycles, these test reward cycles into whatever work you're doing. So if you're writing an essay, make sure you keep looking at that word count. Go away for 10 minutes and type, and then check the word count, and then you get that little reward. Or just make it look nicer. Zoom out and think that's the work I've done and feel that little pang of reward. Low dopamine is one of the big reasons that we struggle with focus and attention. And in fact, low dopamine in certain brain areas is one of the most likely explanations for ADHD in many cases. You can boost dopamine, of course, with caffeine or with a bunch of nootropics, but using the techniques that I've recommended here to boost it naturally is far preferable. Oh, and one last thing, of course, practice. If you practice with any brain region, it will get larger. I've talked on this channel a lot about brain plasticity. We know that like a muscle, training certain brain areas will make them get bigger. When I started out writing essays um, full-time as my career, I, my goal was to write 4,000 words a day. So in eight hours, nine hours, I try and write 4,000 words. Today, I write sometimes as much as 20 or even 30,000 words a day. I start my mornings, I work for Android Authority until one, and then after that, I'll write at least 10,000 in the remaining few hours of the day. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that with practice, you can focus more on anything. So if you're not focusing right away, don't feel bad, just keep at it, keep trying, and eventually that thing, that specific task in particular, will become easier to focus on because you'll be used to it and your brain will have adapted. Hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. If you did, then please leave a like and comment down below. I love discussing these topics with you guys. Um, and stay tuned for the next one. Subscribe if you'd like to see more like this. Hit the bell button for notifications. And I've got much more on the way on bodybuilding, brain training, fitness, parkour, martial arts, nootropics, you name it. Got some cool ideas, hopefully, that I'm working on right now. So yeah, can't wait to share those with you. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.